Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, I'd like to say good morning to you and uh, welcome you to the fourth Economic and Business Breakfast Forum. Uh, and this is an initiative that First National Bank has been uh, organizing, uh, making this the fourth edition. And uh, we're grateful for a platform uh, where minds can meet to review how well our economies are doing across the continent and particularly to give us insights into where one can put your money. Uh, when you've earned your money very, very hard uh, or the hard way, um, it always helps to get insight into where to put it and uh, so that you get the right returns. So you're all very welcome. My name is Inshira Addo and I work with the multimedia group. I'm a broadcast journalist and uh, a lifelong learner, so this for me is an opportunity also to learn as much as I'm sure uh, you are looking forward to. We will be hearing from um, specialists um, from uh, RMB uh, to share uh, their thoughts on uh, the report that we'll be launching later this morning. And then we'll have a conversation um, about Ghana's own place um, in the ranking of countries across the continent as far as where to invest is concerned. And uh, ultimately, we will hopefully walk away with some new thoughts and new thinking, uh, really, that we can act on to ensure that um, we're taking steps to climb up the ranking and hopefully by so doing improve the lots of every man and woman in this room and beyond. So again, you're very welcome uh, to the fourth Economic and Business Breakfast Forum. And uh, we'll start off by welcoming the Chief Executive of First National Bank Ghana, Mr. Richard Hudson, to give us a welcome address. Let's welcome him with a round of applause, please. Morning, morning all. Um, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, once again to First National Bank's annual business and economic forum. As um, the MC said earlier, it is our fourth, uh, the fourth time we are hosting this event, which brings together business executives, policy makers, and some of the smartest brains in our institutions of higher learning to, di to discuss and brainstorm investment trends in Africa. It's based on the, the, business, the report which was generated by Rand Merchant Bank, Where to Invest in Africa. Um, and Rand Merchant Bank is the corporate and investment banking arm of the first Rand Group, of which we are 100% subsidiary. I'm delighted that once again, we have uh, Celeste Falconer and Neville Man Mandemeeker, who are the co-authors of the 2019 report. And they have spent a lot of time analyzing the trends in Africa and in particular, the impact that they may have on Ghana as well. Um, First National Bank is a bank which understands businesses, and we are, are as interested in your growth as you are. I mean, after all, we consider ourselves as your business partners. So we are therefore hopeful that the deliberations today will give you a better insight into Ghana's key economic performance metrics uh, to help you make more informed decisions which will, which will uh, enhance your business. We all know how challenging the last few uh, months have been, or years actually, have been with regard to the banking um, industry. The enforcement of the new minimum capital requirement of 400 million has changed the banking landscape quite considerably in recent times. At First National Bank, we were able to meet the minimum capital requirement thanks to a fresh injection of capital by our, by our parent company. And I think we can all take that as a sign of confidence in the, in the Ghana economy and, in, and indeed in First National Bank Ghana as well. The past few weeks have also seen a lot of turbulence in the, in the foreign exchange markets where the CED initially lost, uh, lost considerable ground against the US dollar before thankfully recovering quite considerably, considerably in recent times. And I'm sure that Celeste and Neville will, will, have a, will shed some more light on that as well. So while we are delighted with the recent recovery in the CD and hope that it continues, hope is not enough. Uh, for most outsiders looking in and observing recent development, developments in Ghana, 
These are uncertain times which demand investor caution. But for us at First National Bank, we see this as an opportunity. This uncertainty always produces um, opportunities for growth and, and, and an opportunity for us to demonstrate our resilience. So in these times of uncertainty, we ask you, how can we help you? As Africa's most innovative bank, we will continue to innovate and provide clients with the needed digital banking solutions that will make your lives easier, better, and more productive. The Breakfast Forum is just one of the many avenues which we want to use to make our presence felt in Ghana. I'm hopeful that the discussions will, we have today and the ideas generated will help boost Ghana's reputation as one of the best investment destinations of the continent. Finally, I'm delighted to see that we have so many customers of our bank here, as well as from other banks as well, and hopefully next year I'll be able to welcome you as customers of First National. So once again, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to First National Bank's Economic um, and Business Breakfast Forum for 2019. Thank you. Can we do a better round of applause for Mr. Hudson? <laughs> Went straight to the point, recounting recent history and uh, the hopes of the future and setting the tone properly for a very interesting conversation. Uh, ahead of the conversation, we'll have a presentation by the co-authors of the report. Uh, Celeste Falconer uh, is making a return, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you back. And uh, as we progress, um, she didn't come alone. She came with the co-author, uh, Neville Mandimika. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome them as they give us the presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I firstly want to thank First National Bank of Ghana for having me every year. It's always nice to come to one of my favorite countries in Africa. I'm not just saying that because I'm here. And then I brought Neville to make us look even better. I'm the handsome man on my right. Um, he's only got two slides to do. I'm doing the rest. Um, but I think he's doing one of the more difficult slides of the capital markets in, in Ghana. But without further ado, um, I would like to go straight into the presentation because obviously time permitting, I want to highlight what the key findings is of our flagship doc document called Where to Invest in Africa. It's now in its eighth edition and we're almost heading to the 10 year anniversary. Um, and then also dig a little bit deeper into the theme that we have in the document this year, which I'll discuss now. And then of course just end off with where we are seeing Africa, or Ghana rather, um, representing itself in Africa and how it's been doing over the past few years, but mostly with the focus on how we are going to do in the next five years. Going straight into the document, um, which is available on our website, we look at specifically the economic side of African economies and we look at the business environment. Now specifically, looking at the overview of the, the document, we look at who's the best ranked economies in Africa according to their attractiveness. So that's called, according to a certain methodology that we use um, and highlighting specifically economic outlook, so the growth over the next few years, GDP growth, also the market size of each of these economies, where we know that Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa are your largest markets. And then I think the most important component that we look at is your operating environment. So how easy is it to do business in these economies? For that component, we use different surveys across the world, uh, specifically looking at the World Bank's Doing Business Report. We also look at the World Economic Forum's Competitiveness Report, um, giving us an indication of where we are seeing improvements in, in the regulatory environment in most of the African countries. Together, we give 50% weighting to your economic activity scoring, and then 50% weighting to your operating environment scoring. It might sound like quite a simple methodology. The reason why we keep it this high level is because there are so many different sectors that are sitting in this room at the moment, um, looking at different risk appetite, looking at different avenues of investing into our African markets. Within the document, however, we do give different weightings to all of these indicators. So you can literally play around a little bit to see where you benefit the most, whether it's from a risk-off perspective, a risk-on perspective, or if you want to see where the biggest growing markets are going to be one day. 
Essentially, the rankings that I'm going to show you now is this 50% economic activity scoring and the 50% of your operating environment. So who are the winners in this year's publication? Egypt, for the second time in the eight years that we've been writing this document, has made the number one spot. It's overtaken South Africa as the most attractive investment environment, much to the dismay of um, us South Africans um, and our media. But there's reason for this. If we go back and look at the methodology that I've just explained, Egypt's growth rates are much higher at the moment and forecasted for the next few years. Where South Africa is only going to grow about 1% to 2% over the next three years, Egypt is growing by 4% to 5%. And of course, Egypt is now the largest market in Africa, above Nigeria, if we look at it in purchasing power terms. South Africa is still one of the best business environments. So if we had to look at it from a risk component, South Africa will still be number one. We are still the, lar the largest markets, capital market and portfolio or equity markets, and we're the most liquid. So there's reason why we are still um, number two as the most attractive investment destination. I don't want to go through all of these countries because that can take me all 30 minutes that I have to speak. But I just want to highlight that the countries that are often, well, mo al almost all the time in the top 10 are your East African stalwarts like Kenya, Tanzania and Ethiopia. And then from a West Africa perspective, we see Ghana and Nigeria and also Cote d'Ivoire coming into the top 10. And then from a North African perspective, we always see Egypt and Morocco in your top five. Highlighting Ghana, if you, do, if you did read the previous year's document, unfortunately Ghana has slipped down the rankings. Where Ghana was number five in last year's document, it is now number nine. But I think we would rather leave that discussion for when we have the panel and where we will answer those questions. But in short, it is the fiscal indiscipline that we've seen in Ghana over the past few years that is now delayed, showing a delayed reflection in some of the surveys. So we can see there's still that investor concern of what is going to happen um, from a fiscal health perspective in Ghana over the next few years. That's the main reason. And we can also discuss all the other countries after the breakfast presentation. The main focus is who's the next top 10. So we can see other countries that you might have asked, where's Mauritius, where's the Botswana, for instance? Very easy business environments. Why aren't they in the top 10? But we always say they have still very small markets, and these markets only have about 4 million people altogether in Mauritius, in Botswana, in Namibia. Also, these markets are only growing by about 2 to 3% over the next few years, so very similar to the rest of Southern Africa, we are feeling the pain. The consumer is not doing very well. The extractive industries are also not doing that well because of slower than expected commodity prices. Then from a Southern Af African perspective, we also see one of our countries, Zambia, in the fall. Zambia is also a country that is currently battling with also its own fiscal indiscipline. Um, and then another country that has come back into the top 20, a very interesting one, is Angola. Angola, the reason why it's moved back into the top 20 is higher oil prices, and we've seen a significant change in the, in the political stability of the country over the past two years. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the crux of the Where to Invest in Africa document. So you can see now who the top 20 most attractive destinations are in Africa. And of course, we can also use the panel discussion to argue some of these countries that are in the top 20. A very good example. Tanzania being in the top 10 is being questioned quite often by some of our clients because it's a very difficult business environment and we see that the regulatory environment is being clamped down on. Um, if we look at specifically what is going to happen in Africa from a growth perspective, this is the regional GDP growth profile. Now we can see that your countries in your merging and developing Asia are the ones that is going to drive this growth. Yes, we are indeed seeing a country like China experience, uh, experiencing a slight soft landing, um, but it is still an economy that invests heavily into Africa, and we do not expect that to change anytime soon. But the question is, over the long term, where is Africa sitting? So we're still above most other regions in the world, and we're above world growth. But I do not think that we are going to experience that 6 to 7% growth rates that we saw a few years back um, in the future. I think it will be around a 3 to 4%. The biggest reason for this 
is that we are still battling with rising debt levels. As in the country of Ghana, we understand that experience. And we also see weak credit growth, where it used to be quite strong over the past few years. We are seeing that developing again, but it's going to be at too much of a sl too slow a pace. But the prospects are still strong. So we still have resources. Even though it could be the crux of African econ economies, we still have it. And I believe that in the next few years, agriculture is going to be one of the biggest drivers of your resources sectors in Africa. We still have strong demographics. We still need countries to take advantage of this. We are seeing improved business environments. It's only in certain pockets across the continent, and the document uh, does highlight which countries those are. And of course, we are seeing the potential of more revenue collection. Even though this is a big risk, that sh it should be both in the risk and the prospect section. But revenue collection is still so low in Africa. Just a few simple changes that governments make can improve this revenue collection. And one of the areas that is an easy way to do this is bringing your informal sector into the formal sector. Governments need to get strong initiatives for these informal and entrepreneurs to come and enter uh, the formal sector, whether it's lower taxes or just ease of getting their goods from point A to point B. Many aspects governments can tackle. Then specifically looking at the most problematic factors of doing business in Africa. It is liquidity, so access to financing, and it's infrastructure. And this leads me exactly to the theme that we are focusing on this year in this document, is infrastructure. The 2018 document looked at access to financing. So if you want to go back to those documents, we, we focus on the currency risk in most of these economies, where the liquidity is coming from, what are the largest export revenue earners for each country in Africa. This year we focus on infrastructure. We have, we, we have seen a significant deficit over the past few years, and that deficit is just growing. So briefly, and I do understand that the text on this slide might be quite small, and for those in the back not seeing it, but it's just to highlight that the infrastructure needs in Africa has now changed from that 90 billion US dollar deficit annually to about 130 to 170 billion dollars now annually. That's the changes we've seen in the latest Africa Development Bank report. And it's nothing new, we all know the problems. It's electricity, water, technology, and the actual hard infrastructure of road networks, railway, ports. And this year's document focuses exactly on that. Where does the deficit lie in each of these countries? And with that deficit, we highlight that this is the major opportunity for you as investors to go into these markets. If we look specifically at which countries have the best quality infrastructure, and again, I will highlight, um, because the text is so small, this is an index by the African Development Bank looking at all types of quality of all infrastructure in Africa. It's roads, railway, it also looks at your water and sanitation, it also looks at electricity, and then lastly, at your health and your education, so your more soft infrastructure. And the winners here are countries like the island economies, Seychelles. Seychelles has the best quality infrastructure in Africa. And the reason for this, and that most island economies have good infrastructure, is because they want to attract tourists. They want to get those tourists safely from point A to point B. And of course, they've got some of the best ICT, or information and communication technology, in Africa. It's because they want their tourists to be able to connect to the outside world in an easy manner. We also see that countries in North Africa and Southern Africa are also at the top of the infrastructure rankings. It is because we are, South, South Africa specifically, one of your more developed economies, Egypt also. Egypt, in fact, um, has been ranked better infrastructure than South Africa. And a very um, good example here of a country that can ruin its infrastructure is Libya. This is the 2018 index for Libya. So we're doing, we can see Libya is actually third best infrastructure quality in Africa. But now what we've seen with the political turmoil, the civil war, it's actually been breaking down that infrastructure. So in the next year's survey, Libya will definitely not be in the top 10. Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana is still there. They're in the top 15 of best infrastructure quality in Africa, but there's still a lot to do in the country. Most of West Africa is investing below 3% of overall government GDP 
into infrastructure. And we have learned that you need about 6% to 7% investment of your GDP into infrastructure to at least have growth rates above a 3% annually in Africa. So there's a significant need still in the market. Before I end off uh, with looking at the Where to Invest in Africa document and go more into what's happening in the Ghanaian economy, we look at financing of infrastructure. Now, this is the opportunity and the deficit that I've highlighted earlier. At the moment, it is the governments that are investing the most into infrastructure development in Africa. But this is the problem. As I've mentioned earlier, most of these governments only invest 3% of overall GDP into this development. So it's something that needs to change drastically. In fact, you can see by the following slide that the Africa's infrastructure funding sectoral split is quite broad. Compare left-hand side to the right-hand side. On the left, that is your government investment into infrastructure. We can see that goes predominantly into your harder infrastructure, like your uh, electricity, and then your um, energy, sorry, your transport and your energy and utilities, which is understandable. The government needs to win votes, so you still need to invest in, in, in aspects that will get the economy going and that also can get your people from point A to point B. If we look at the right-hand side, private funding, which is only 10% of overall funding into um, African infrastructure, these companies focus mostly on construction. And why is the reason for this? It's because construction is your easier and short-term investment or infrastructure investment projects than what we see in your electricity or in your roads and railway networks. It's because the risk in Africa is still very high. So we see that infrastructure investors from a private perspective are still wary to invest in your long-term projects. We are hoping that this movement will change over the next few years, but that is where the regula re regulators need to step in and start changing their business environment to get this funding into the market. And it's at a critical time. As I've mentioned earlier, your debt levels are increasing significantly in Africa. Um, so we are needing that private sector investment to come in. So things need to change very quickly before we are in highly debt distressed economies across most of the African continent. Just to also highlight your public and private investment, this is just a graph illustrating the number of projects happening in most of our countries in Africa. Again, the text is quite small, but I'll just highlight that Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Egypt are the largest recipients or the largest projects happening at the moment in those economies. Where you can see the blue um, bar is your public investment projects, and your private is the yellow bar. Countries like South Africa is also still seeing investment, but we're starting to drop down. It's because of our, the risk that is perceived is quite getting, or getting higher in Africa, or South Africa rather. And of course, us having the potential of being downgraded, downgraded again by one of the ratings agencies. But essentially, this is again highlighting the problem we have. It's the public sector that is investing. And of course, we have to highlight the biggest problem across Africa at the moment, well, not at the moment, it's been for many years, is corruption. And that is affecting this investment going into these infrastructure projects. I just also want to lastly highlight, um, from an investment attractiveness perspective, what we've done with this graph is just highlight the previous graph that I showed you, number of projects happening in Africa at the moment from an infrastructure perspective, and we've plotted it um, on your, on your y-axis against the RMB's investment attractiveness scoring, those top 20 that I showed you earlier. And we can see there's a very strong correlation between those countries that have very active and a large amount of investment into infrastructure projects so a, a very strongly correlated, as I've highlighted, to where your most in, uh, attractive investment destinations are lying. So I think the, the opportunities there for, in, uh, for countries to at least bring them back into the top 10 or move up um, into your top five most attractive investment destinations is infrastructure development. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is where to invest in Africa, the publication in a nutshell. There's still many slides that I can show you and that we will have available for you after the breakfast presentation. But, of course, we are also here to give you our views of what's happening in the Ghana economy. Specifically, I will highlight all your general macroeconomic indicators. I'll 
briefly focus on what we expect to happen with your growth rates, what we expect to happen with inflation and your interest rates. Naturally, we have to discuss the currency, um, but I think I came at a very good time when we've seen the currency come back nicely and strongly. And then, of course, Neville will end off with just highlighting what's happening in your capital market, so your local and your um, hard currency bond market. So starting off with uh, your normalizing GDP growth rate. Now, when we are talking about normalizing, what we are saying is that growth is just going to go from that high peak of 8.5% that we saw recently, normalizing back to around a 5% growth rate. So it's nothing to be concerned about. The reason why it is normalizing is that oil production that is normalizing. So we saw a very nice um, increase in your oil production, more than 50% increase in 2018, and a, a expected about 40%, 30 to 40% increase in 2019. So that's boosted your growth rates quite significantly. As I mentioned, that will ease off to a very strong 5% growth rate. We can actually see that it is tracking above the sub-Saharan average of 4% growth. So still strong growth, but unfortunately, this growth is still driven by your extractive industry. So gold and oil will still will now be the largest, or has been the largest providers of GDP growth. And unfortunately, we are seeing that your non-oil or your non-extractive industries are still battling ever so slightly um, to, to boost that overall GDP growth rate. And the reason for this is, unfortunately, with the under-execution of CapEx or capital expenditure, basically due to the fact that the economy or that the government had to start consolidating fiscally, we have seen that affecting capital expenditure into the market. And that's been affecting the growth, growth rates quite significantly. There's not enough money to be able to spend as much as the government would want to, to be able to boost the growth rates even more. There's also been poor asset quality in the banking sector, but we are seeing that changing now, especially with after the recapitalization that Richard has been referring to. Um, so we are expecting that your loan growth will expand again over the next few years, and private sector credit extension will also now be boosted. So we, we feel that that's going to play a big part in that 5% growth rate that we are expecting over the next few years. But it is these two sectors, gold and oil, that is still going to be your key drivers. And it's still doing relatively well. Specifically looking at your gold production on the left-hand side, we are starting to see that it's tracking up. Um, and the reason for this is not only that we expect gold prices to increase ever so slightly in 2019, so that will boost your, your export revenues, but we are starting to see that your big mining companies, Anglo Gold Ashanti, Goldfields for instance, have decided that they are going to increase the lifespan of their gold production, so that means they're going to invest more into their mining, that means they are investing more into the economy, so that's a positive. On the right-hand side, even though we are seeing crude oil production that is, will eventually start normalizing, it's just a normal thing to happen. We've seen it in most countries that, uh, that produce oil. Um, but unfortunately, that crude production is still very minimal compared to what we see other countries are producing, like your Angolas and Nigerias of Africa. But it will contribute to that foreign exchange earnings that we do need over the next few years to keep the currency at a relatively stable level. So at the moment, that's the, I won't say the saving grace for Ghana, but it is helping definitely keep that, uh, that GDP growth rate propped up. Then I just want to highlight what our view is on inflation and rates, and, and with our esteemed peer, um, uh, panel members, we can also discuss that in further detail. Indeed, we are expecting February and March numbers. Well, we've seen February, March, uh, February numbers coming in um, at slightly higher than what we saw in January. Um, but that is on the back of that weakness that we saw in the SEDI, which is most likely going to filter through further into March. But thereafter, we will see the inflation rate stabilize again. With that, um, it is heading, it's possible that it can head close to that 10%, but we do not expect it to go over the double digits. So this is still a positive. It means that we are still trending very close to your target band. That's that green um, section that you can see on the graph on the right-hand side. With that, we expect the policy rate to remain unchanged at 16%, something we can debate of whether it should have been dropped to 16%, and it's part of the reason why it's probably exacerbated the currency instability that we have seen over the past few weeks. 
but essentially we cannot see inflation coming down significantly for, for the central bank to cut rates even further. And of course, we know that the central bank would also want to maintain an attractive uh, rates for investors to come into the financial markets. So we believe that there won't be any change uh, to this policy rate. There are even calls for them to reverse the 100% or the 100 basis points cut that we saw recently. I do think that will just send very confusing messages to the market um, and it will just make it unstable or, or and making concerns for investors of what is really going to happen in future from a monetary policy perspective. So for now, that's our view. 16% for probably most of the year. And then, of course, we feel that the FX supply and the stable utility prices will also support stable inflation over the next few months. So there's no big red flags that is um, flying in front of us from an inflation perspective. I think what we um, should be concerned about is your fiscal discipline over the next few years. This has probably gone as big as test that we have seen um, in a very long time. And of course we know it's because the IMF has now exited the market or is almost exiting the market. Um, they did have a positive uh, report on the, the latest review, um, which is great for, for sentiment. But of course, sentiment also needs to be backed by a track record. So the budget deficit, uh, um, what we're expecting for 2019 is 4.5%. So it's very close to the 4.3% deficit that the government is expecting over the next few years. The reason for the increase is the government would want to invest more into infrastructure projects, which is a positive. My biggest problem is, will the revenue collection be able to manage that expectation? And we have seen that revenue collection came or underperformed in the 2018 budget. This is where we know that the government needs to work hard on that tax collection, revenue, uh, tax collection especially. That is where we also saw a bit of a drawback. So if we invest in, into to changes like that, um, and if we also see that the government maintains that fiscal discipline of below 5% deficit over the next few years, I think that we will continue seeing investors coming into the market. They just want that certainty. So the positive also of the latest budget, the outdated earmarked funds, as well as your unsustainable tax exemptions, will be reviewed. I think that is a, the major positive. We just need to see that now happening. I want to highlight, though, the biggest concerns we have over the next few years. The fiscal adjustments definitely has been substantial. But it is definitely also reflecting, as I've mentioned earlier, in the capital expenditure of the government into the market. So we are going to see some missing targets because we are going to see some missing revenue targets as well. There's also been sizable fiscal slippages, as we all know, during election years. Some of our clients, specifically from London, are asking us what is really going to change in the next election to not have them overspend again. A very good question, which we cannot answer. The Ghanaian track record is of overspending during election time. And then, of course, you've got the extra concern of the extended credit facility of the IMF now coming to an end. So public debt is set to fall because of that fiscal consolidation. But unfortunately, we do not believe that it will go under 50% for at least the next five years. And 50% is, uh, is, is quite a challenging number for any African country to be able to maintain. And I know Neville will also touch on um, how we are going to, um, or how that's going to reflect in the debt market. The positive thing about the new fiscal rules is that we are seeing the government making the effort, especially when we see them putting that cap on a 5% deficit. But unfortunately, as I've mentioned, track record is very key for investors to come into African markets. So these new rules, we do not have a tra track record. We do not know if it is going to work. Even though it's positive, it's something that I, I do believe investors will look at as a wait and see process. And we will actually see that filtering into the market where we, where we would have seen strong investment coming into the market once the EM um, risk on environment is back. But unfortunately, with that track record, we're going to see investors uh, put a hold on significant investment into the market. I will end off before I hand over to Neville on the volatile SEDI. You can see I've put that last so I can quickly run through because trying to forecast this currency at the moment is very difficult. The, 
Traditionally, the SEDI is a depreciatory currency because the imports exceed your exports, so it's just a natural progression. And we see that in most of the African countries. And also with it being a managed float, we do not see this depreciation going out of hand. But obviously in recent weeks, we saw significant vol volatility in the SEDI. There were different reasons, and we can go through them very briefly because I know you know your markets also very well, but it was seasonal. So we always see in January and February a significant weakness in the currency, mainly because importers are demanding um, goods uh, or demanding dollars to pay off goods. And then, of course, we have also seen EM suffering a capital flight. So Ghana being one of your most, well, well more of your EM well, being one of the countries, rather, in West Africa, after Nigeria being a recipient of portfolio inflows, we have seen an outflow over the past few months, which has heightened that concern about investing into the continent. And then we've got, naturally, the rate cut that we've seen recently, and that has exacerbated the situation from the steady volatility. So, yes, we are starting to see some regulatory changes by the central bank, um, and they are just saying that it is not to curb what happened now, it is to potentially curb massive liquidity, liquidity swings in the future. But it's something we're watching this space, we just need to get more clarification of some of the changes. So we are quite positive and we knew, we felt, that the currency will eventually come back. It, it does usually in a traditional way come back after a volatile January and February, but we also knew that there will most likely be a Eurobond issuance that they will tap into the cocoa bod, that the IMF funding is going to come through. And then, of course, we saw a significant reversal in some of the um, losses because of that financial arran arrangement the central bank made to start replenishing the reserves. So we can see uh, arguments for our for steady stability, and we're keeping our year in forecast at 520. Um, we'll see how it goes. But we uh, the financing arrangement by the Bank of Ghana with that, the IMF disbursement that just came through or will be coming through after the review of almost 200 million. You've now got a euro bond of 3 billion US dollars. There's still a 300 million drawdown of the Cocobot syndicated low coming through. Then, of course, we are starting to see that your oil exports are increasing again, and it's expected to increase to about 180,000 barrels per day. Then we know that uh, China's Sino Hydro drawdown. Uh, could also be a debatable drawdown, but that we can leave for, um, for um, later discussion. And then, of course, we are going to see a restrictive budget and a positive trade balance. So all of these reasons are backing the reason why we think the currency is stable to come back and will probably end the year at 520. I'm also handing over now to Neville so that he can maybe just... Um, conclude uh, the reason why we're expecting steady stability and how the financial markets and specifically the capital markets have been doing of late. Uh, so, so I think uh, Celeste made a mistake. We won't be concluding, but for the next three hours, I'm going to be walking through the minutia of the fixed income. On. No, I'm joking. We as economists are paid to talk, so uh, that, that's part of uh, what I'm getting paid for, so I have to talk a lot. Um, no, but I'm joking. But I think the, the, the important thing uh, over the last, I would say, a uh, few weeks um, has been the, the relationship between the domestic fixed income market and what has been happening in the, in the city. And I think there's some, there some insights in terms of the interplay between these two asset classes that we can possibly dive into. So what I've plotted for you on the top chart there is over, over the next couple of months, um, the, what, what portion of the interest uh, that is due on the domestic bond markets that is due to the offshore market and what is due to the domestic uh, bond market. Simply because of the, the reason between that the interplay between the offshore market and the domestic is quite important in terms of the pressure that we see on the FX market. So if you typically have a large base of offshore investors that no longer feel that they are, you know, it's a worthy investment to be invested in the domestic market, then that's going to put pressure on the on the fixed in, on the uh, on the FX market. And we've seen that over the last uh, few weeks or so, where there were some issues around global emerging markets and whether that was a good play for investors, you know, with dollar funding who are typically invested in the, in the Ghanaian market, whether that it's, it's a good investment or not. So we saw uh, some pressure in terms of uh, coupon payments that were possibly exiting, and we saw some of that feeding into the FX volatility that Celeste just explained. So that is quite important for us as we look at Ghana in the context of what is happening in the global EM space. Right now, we've got a fairly... Um, 
what can I say, accommodative EMU environment where uh, people are starting to look for riskier assets, and that is good for us sitting here simply because there is you know, appetite for offshore investors to be looking at Ghanaian assets again. But the problem with that is that sentiment tends to be extremely fickle. So uh, in one week, you know, you've got a risk on environment. In the other week, you've got everyone that is pulling their money out. So a lot of that has to do with what is happening with the Federal Reserve and all the other major central banks. And part of that dynamic will tend to affect us simply because of the large offshore holding that we have in terms of the domestic fixed income market. And that brings me to the bottom slide there, where in the, con in the greater scheme of things, you know, is Ghana really that bad in terms of uh, how much offshore investors tend to own of the domestic markets? What I've plotted for you there is you can see Ghana tends to play within the top quarter of broader emerging markets that uh, usually fixed income investors tend to play in. And that is an important matrix for us to keep a hold of simply because of if we see you know, events in the global space starting to change, we can see some of that feeding through into, in, into our domestic FX market. So on a volatility basis, you know, we tend to see that you know, the RAND, for example, is extremely volatile because there's a large offshore holding and we're seeing some of that dynamic feed through into, into Ghana as well. So it's an important one to keep a hold of in terms of what the offshore investor base is doing in so far as uh, they are uh, their the, the holding of domestic fixed income uh, assets. So that leads me to uh, what is happening from a Eurobond perspective, and I'm sure uh, you know, the, the papers here were littered in terms of uh, what happened in the, in the Eurobond roadshow that, we, that, that the ministers um, and, and the authorities recently came from, where there was a $3 billion uh, Eurobond that was um, uh, garnered from the offshore markets, and a large part of that is going to be used you know, for you know, maturing uh, some of the shorter dated instruments. And what happened there, I think, is a function of several things. Number one, there are concerns around, you know, what Ghana looks like, you know, post uh, IMF. And I think the, the sentiment, judging from some of the conversations that I've had with offshore investors, is that, you know, there are some questions around whether uh, we we're going to see a large fiscal indiscipline or whether we're going to uh, continue to see this fiscal, uh, fiscal prudence that we've seen over the last couple of years. And the answer in terms of where the market is at the moment is somewhere in the middle. So we might see, uh, you know, some fiscal slippage. I mean, we are going to be entering an, an election period, but at the same time, there is a view that you know the the lessons that have been learned under the the IMF program will be carried through over the next few years, and that partly contributed to the large demand that we saw of these euro bonds. At some point, there was 22 the order book was 22 billion relative to the three billion that was uh, ultimately issued. So it was, there was huge appetite around that. But it's not all uh, you know for for Ghana's credit. I think, well, like I mentioned earlier, there is some issues around what is happening from a global. EM environment. And, you know, with what the Fed has been saying in terms of some of its uh, statements, has really played in the favor of uh, frontier markets and emerging markets. And that played into uh, some of the demands that we saw for the, for the Ghana paper. And, of course, we saw these, uh, this was the first issuance uh, out of Africa this year. So there was a real starvation of, uh, of assets uh, around euro bonds. So this, you know, really worked well in, in our favor. So I think the timing of that was particularly great in terms of ability to actually raise uh, the amount of money they did at the price that they did. What I found particularly interesting is as we went through you know, the final uh, few hours of that particular issuance, normally you tend to see that uh, you know, existing bonds tend to weaken simply because of the new supply that was coming through. But we saw the opposite in terms of what existing Ghana Euro bonds were doing leading up to the final issuance, and we saw that the price was actually appreciating, which shows that there was a huge appetite for, for Ghanaian paper. So I think there are some strong signs in terms of investors willing to give uh, Ghana a second look in terms of uh, you know, what the, the, the ministry is doing and what the fiscal policies are going to be going forward. So that should be uh, uh, quite positive for us uh, sitting here uh, with, uh, with a view in terms of what's happening from a fixed income space. So I think the interplay between the, the local fixed income market and the eurobond uh, market gives us a very good sense in terms of how offshores are looking at uh, the developments that are happening here locally and the ability to actually raise funding at, at different prices. So uh, I think so far it's, uh, it's thumbs up, um, and we hope uh, you know, that over the next few months and over the next few years, we'll continue to see that fiscal discipline. That would obviously work well in terms of ability to actually raise funding, which ultimately feeds into uh, debt servicing costs and, and everything else that goes with the macroeconomic view. So uh, that is my two-minute spiel. Uh, I'm not going to give you the three-hour version. Um, at this point, I will uh, ask our MC to, to come and introduce the, the panel going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Neville. And uh, we're not going to dwell too much. Uh, let's get the experts here and get their thoughts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome the Minister uh, for Information, Mr. Kujo Obonkrumah. And also Professor Peter Corti from uh, ISA to join the panel as well. I'd like to. Uh, at this point, I'd like to point out that uh, if you have questions, you can go online to slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com, and uh, enter Ghana first uh, in the meeting column, and that should take you to a page where you can submit all your questions, and then we can uh, fill them and pass them on to the panelists to answer. Uh, we're live on Joy 99.7 FM, also live on uh, the Joy News channel, uh, which is uh, broadcasting on the multi-TV platform and also on DSTV channel 421 across Africa. And um, the hashtag to use is Ghana's Economy First. And uh, also, uh, for those of you who would like to tell the world where we are, we're also streaming live on myjoyonline.com as well as on all platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope at First National Bank GH. So I'm going to dive straight into the questions. I'd like to start off with the Minister of Information. And this is not picking on you in any way at all. Uh, but I just would like to get your thoughts on um, whether there were any highlights from Neville and uh, Celeste's presentation. Try. Yes, um, thank you. And um, good morning to Neville, Celeste, and to uh, Prof and to the audience here. Um, no, I don't mind being picked on at all. But specifically, there were a number of things that I think come out quite strongly in the presentation. And the first is that this is more or less like a poll of polls, putting together what uh, various other polls or various other reports say. Mm. And one of the things that come or comes home very strongly to me is that, yes, Ghana is reforming, but others like Rwanda, Kenya, Nigeria are making more significant reforms than we are doing. And what that says is that, for example, moving on, uh, reforms must also be in very significant areas. If you look at the Nigerian detail, for example, the forex issue uh, is one issue that is very significant within the body of reforms. And when you tackle that alone, it kind of has a way of pushing you further than others. So in terms of um, our reforms moving forward, we have to tackle some of the very significant issues. And I think as time goes on, we'll have the opportunity to hit on a few of those. Our reforms also have to be benchmarked with what others are doing or benchmarked to what others are doing. Else you can be of the view that you are reforming, but others will outpace you and you might come out you know, slipping from five to nine uh, and it may look like you haven't done much. And so you need to benchmark um, as well. On the north side of the presentation, which deals with the economic activity, I think what comes out to me strongly is that we have to stimulate higher, broad-based, uh, resilient growth. I mean, what has worked for us in the recent years, which is now going to normalize, um, can do with some more broader uh, base. It's mostly in the oil and gas area, but what it means is that we also have to broaden it and make it more resilient and regular. So that in, in, in terms of the economic activity space, um, as compared to other jurisdictions, we don't lag behind um, that much. For me, those are the first things that uh, hit me, in addition to the other opportunities, etc., that are available. Okay. So we have about 30 minutes, so I'm just going to um, do a quick round with each of you, and then we'll all jump in and have one big uh, conversation. Um, I I'm coming back to you again, Kujo. Uh, so we've dropped from five to nine. Um, what plans do you think, or what actions would be required to one, hopefully stop us from slipping out of the top 10, but more importantly, drive us further up the ranking. Um, thanks. So like I said, it's in two broad sides. There's the economic activity side, and then there's the reform space. 
in the reform space, we have to tackle, as I hinted earlier, some of the more significant uh, you know, issues. You can have a list of nine reform items, uh, but depending on where they fit on the pain point of the business community, if they are not that significant, you won't very far. One of the things that we need to very quickly deal with is the issue of trade facilitation and the difficulties that are associated with trade facilitation. It has a way of translating even into uh, prices for products that are imported, uh, etc. And currently, government has been heavily engaged on improving the trade facilitation framework so that uh, it is easier for people who want to do business, particularly on the international uh, markets in and out, to find space so to do. Another thing that we have to very strongly tackle in the reform area is access to financing. And you were talking about uh, you know, um, credit growth and even on the um, equity sides, the availability of a pool of funds um, to fuel business. Again, like you mentioned, because of the fiscal indiscipline in recent years, which is now coming home to roost, you will find that, for example, in the financial services sector, which is what gives access to credit, you've had um, 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 a constriction of it. You've had to literally do a bailout uh, in the financial services sector. And you are now getting uh, the financial services sector a bit more resilient to get credit back on its feet. And so what we need to do is to quicken our efforts in the access to financing space um, so that the private person who is requiring financing to fuel his growth in that area also has room to go. Very quickly, we also have to get a thumb on these um, stability indicators like inflation, currency, interest rates. And I'm happy to see that your forecast suggests that we don't have any major red flags in that area, although we would have wished to um, maybe even get it down a bit further. We are using 4.80 for the budget in terms of the currency. You are looking at 5.20. But I think generally we're talking about the fact that stability must remain so that it's easier for business people to uh, do business. I think two quick things that we would or we are looking to do is to ensure that government incentives for strategic um, uh, growth pools are heightened. The areas of interest, low-hanging fruits include infrastructure, like you mentioned, power, water, those areas. But the specific interventions that make it easier for the private sector to play in that space. If you're looking at uh, you know, about 3% of GDP from the government side into infrastructure, and the benchmark is 6%, the test here is what do you do to attract private capital to augment this 3% that you are putting in. So those um, uh, um, government interventions for strategic growth pools, I think we have to be uh, very quick at it. And uh, finally, and, and, and tied to that, significant improvement in infrastructure uh, which supports business and other economic activity. These are, I think, about the five key areas that we are looking to focus on so that we can ease um, perhaps the next report that you put out. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to you, Professor Quarte. Um, in 2018, uh, quarter four to be precise, um, ESA uh, did warn against um, excessive borrowing, uh, and that's not the first time any such warning has gone to any government under the Fourth uh, Republic. Um, but borrowing is sometimes also quite justified. Um, but clearly, we haven't made the strides that we hope to make with the borrowing. So um, how do you see us sustainably continuing to borrow, but grow? Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, debt itself is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to borrow. But how you use the money is what is very important. And to what extent are you able to finance the debt without causing much damage to your economy? Um, yes, we did warn against excessive borrowing because if you look at the debt GDP ratios, it was in the 60s, uh, we at a point hitting 70. I think at a point we had 73%. And if you look at the IMF assessments of, I, I reviewed the assessment reports of several countries, Ghana, Kenya, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and we were amongst the few that were red flagged. Looks like our debt levels were unsustainable, and we could see that having uh, implications on how much revenue, uh, how much expenditure in terms of, we are able to make in terms of capital expenditure, and in certain critical areas. So uh, we needed to raise that red flag, um, as we continue to borrow, 
we, we are hurting certain parts of the economic, critical sectors of the economy, and I think we need to be wary of that. Then how efficient we use this money is very critical. It's not just borrowing for borrowing sake, but what extent are we able to track the funds and make sure that we get value for money in most of these expenditures. I think that's an area that we thought we, we needed to, to flag. One other thing um, we saw is that it's not just borrowing, but we were gradually having a lot of foreign uh, denominated bonds, um, et cetera. And that has repercussions on your exchange rate. And I think the presenter mentioned our capital flight. The least noise or uh, discontent uh, investors will move funds out, and that is one of the reasons why our exchange rate uh, had this turbulence in that short period. So it is important to raise red flags against high uh, debt or borrowing. Okay. Uh, for those of you just tuning in to Joy 99.7, you're joining the fourth economic business um, breakfast uh, forum coming to you from the Mevin Pick Ambassador Hotel here in Accra. And on the panel is the Minister uh, for Information, Mr. Kojopo Nkrumah, and Director of the Economics uh, Division at ESA, uh, Professor Peter Kwate, Celeste Falconer. Uh, is an analyst uh, from RMB as well as uh, Mr. Neville, um, and I'm going to take my time, Mandy Mika uh, is our, uh, making up the panel. And uh, you can join us with your own questions by going to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and uh, enter the code Ghana first, and you'll be able to submit a question so we can try and get some answers for you. Uh, that said, uh, Prof, Inflation was highlighted in, in, in the conversation. Um, a number of factors um, were considered um, that if we were able to mitigate would help us stabilize um, inflation, which has a knock-on effect on, on the currency. But how much attention should we pay to inflation? How can it make or break our stride uh, towards economic growth? Um, inflation is a necessary good. Um, you need some level of inflation in your economy. Um, so I don't think we should be so fixated on inflation that we want single-digit inflation, we want low inflation. Yes, some stable level of inflation is good. But I, th I think going forward, and, and I think we've made this point, that we expect that as a country we should have an optimal level of inflation. Uh, we need to estimate that and know that this is the level of inflation that is not going to hurt jobs, that would ensure that, yes, you grow. Uh, because there is a trade-off between inflation and employment. As government tries to cut down on spending, if you are not spending, you are not also uh, helping to create jobs. So we, have to, we need to strike a good balance between how much inflation you can contain uh, to ensure that businesses are able to project and able to invest and, and uh, make revenue. In the same way, you also have to have a cap on how much inflation uh, you can contain. And I think there's been quite a few estimates. Uh, the IMF has uh, some estimates that see anything in the range of, if my memory serves me right, between 15 to 18% for a developing country is acceptable. As a country, I think we need to estimate this optimal rate of inflation so that we know which figure we're actually working with. Thank you. All right, just before we all join in and I start going to the questions coming by Slido, um, finally there was a key point about what the investor community uh, would be looking out for, which is track record from Celeste's uh, presentation. Uh, but So we have some new great ideas on paper. We're now implementing some of them. Um, the world would want to see how well that goes, but we're in a hurry. So how do we build track record in a hurry. It's, it's as though a job advertisement says, you know, we want someone who is five years experience, but the people who really want it have just come out of school. We need to bridge that gap. How can we do that quickly? Um, yes, we're in a hurry, but there are certain basic fundamentals that we need to get right. So for me, uh, getting the macro economy or fundamentals stable is one of the key things that, and I believe uh, government has been uh, working quite well in achieving uh, most of these macro uh, targets. Um, nevertheless, there are quite a few things we need to do right. Um, 
access to credit is very critical for most uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. The cost of credit itself is too high. Uh, if you have to borrow at 31 percent, 28 percent, what kind of business can you actually do and break even? I think that is quite critical. Okay. So we, we need to look, look at that. I'm quite excited. I was quite excited to see the uh, index, the where how we compared with other countries in terms of infrastructure, in terms of you know all, all the key things, power and the rest. But I think it's not just the numbers. What about quality? I think, um, and, and that's a point I make to the, the, the uh, editors of the report. Mm. If you're able to delve down into quality, uh, we can have power. To what extent is it stable to ensure that businesses are able to use this to produce? I think that is very critical. But how, how can we move fast with this? Um, one thing I find a bit lacking uh, in our discourse is what is government doing? What are the government, what are government policies? And, and I can refer you to the 10-point industrialization strategy. Mm -hmm. I always say there is a lot of rich information in there. I believe we should tease out what is in there. How do we implement uh, uh, these uh, um, strategies? If they are well implemented, in my view, if we are able to achieve 60 to 70 percent of what is in there, and I'm sure Ghana will be a better place to live. Mm, I like the silver lining in there. Um, Mr. Pongkrum, I know you want to uh, add a rejoinder, but uh, before then, uh, Celeste, did you anticipate Ghana slipping from five to nine? Let's see. Uh... It helps when it's on. Uh, yes, we did, unfortunately, uh, but it was, it was for two reasons, and the minister has alluded perfectly to the one, to say that other countries have been reforming faster than Ghana. Um, countries like uh, the smaller countries in East Africa, like a Rwanda, to your bigger economies like in Ethiopia, have been moving up the ranks specifically in its business environment rankings um, over the past few years, Rwanda being the fastest reformer, in fact, in the world when it comes to its business environment. So that's the, one of the reasons, but unfortunately the other reason is that fiscal indiscipline that we have seen, unfortunately, and that has uh, brought sentiment down. Not just sentiment, it actually physically showed in some of the surveys that um, tax collection, higher debt levels, um, the effects that it had on ratings agencies, views and reports on, on Ghana in the past three years, which has th thankfully improved, mm -hmm. but that has um, impacted the surveys that we use into the, uh, the inputs. Okay. So, Neville, um, the presentation indicated that one of the areas um, that we'll have to focus on in terms of navigating the challenges would be that we focus on technology infrastructure. Um, if we has had a jump out of the box for a moment, technology and people is being touted as the next level of infrastructure. Can we start refocusing on that instead of the hard brick mortar and steel um, the infrastructure that most of the countries in our grouping uh, are focusing on? Well, I, th I think it's a, it, it's a combination of, of balancing the two uh, because you can't uh, invest in your people, i.e. education, but you can't move the people from one part of the country to the other. So you need to, to take a two-pronged approach where you're obviously focusing on the, on the transport, you know, building bridges and everything else, but at the same time you're ensuring people mobility between, between countries. So in more developed uh, countries, you know, take South Korea for example, it's very easy to, to live in one part of the country and work in another part of the country. Um, so I think th those are some of the things that we need to look at. It's not an either-or situation. Um, and we do see, you know, countries like your, your East African economies, Kenya, for example, you know, taking a, uh, a very uh, determined approach in terms of building the soft infrastructure, which we do focus on in the publication, but at the same time, they're investing heavily in the, in the hard infrastructure perspective. So I think there's some key lessons that we can learn uh, here in Ghana as well in terms of, obviously, the, uh, the enviable goals of reducing, you know, unemployment, etc., but at the same time, improving the hard infrastructure uh, perspective, which would obviously kick... Uh, kick us ahead in terms of the, the rankings that we just saw. 
Okay. All right. So, uh, Mr. Pongkrumah, you had uh, rejoined, uh, and then after which I will go on to our paperless uh, portal uh, for the questions coming in from our audience. Um, not so much a rejoinder, just to um, agree with the two underlining issues that, um, one, we need to demonstrate a track record with the new initiatives that we are rolling out. Because the new initiatives like the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Fiscal um, Advisory Council, the Financial Stability Council uh, are the pegs that will hold down the cancer of fiscal indiscipline that got us here in the first place. But I think the message that I also like to take advantage of and send to the international investor community is that if there's anything that you can look to apart from these, it's also the immediate track record of Ghana as a state. I'm not even talking about the Akufuado administration, but Ghana as a state in the immediate past years has demonstrated a certain level of fiscal discipline which has enabled us come to this point and which we are hoping to keep now with these pieces of legislation, etc., together. And even though, yes, we have an election year ahead of us, it is precisely to guard against our own tendencies that we have gone ahead to uh, put, for example, even some of the sanctions that we've put in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. If the finance minister breaches that cap, he could lose his job. So we have tried to put, even upon ourselves, very hard constraints. And I think that a combination of the track record and the toughness of these constraints should signal the markets that we're hoping not to repeat our mistakes. Okay, well, thanks very much. And uh, for those of you uh, listening and joining us via Facebook, uh, this is the fourth Economic and Business uh, Breakfast Forum brought to you by Thess National Bank, a truly digital bank. So uh, we're asking you to go to slido.com and enter the code Ghana first and send your questions or comments. And I'm going straight to a few of them that have come through now. Quite a number of them are anonymous. Uh, we'll read them all and try and get some answers. I'd like to start off with a question about exchange rate. It's been a topical conversation uh, quite recently. Now, the question is simply this. Five CD, 20 pesos, or four CDs, 80 pesos. Should I be worried as a business person? Who'd like to go for this? I know, I know, I know that I know the expert is here, but I'm sure we would like to hear from uh, more from a government position on that one. So, Mr. Ponkruma, that's yours. My professor is here, so he'll have the answer. <laughs> but very quickly, um, I think the exchange rate often is a matter of worry to all of us because it affects all of us. Um, in addition to the issues that uh, Celeste raised as the causes, one of the things that I think many people haven't noticed that really hit us is that. At the same season when the CD usually comes under pressure, Ghana now had, as a prior action to the exit, to build about $700 million in reserves. So at a time when the CD is ordinarily under pressure and you expect the central bank to be able to assist, at that same time, we had now to be building reserves of about $700 million, And that contributed to the inability to you know, uh, even do a short-term mm. um, 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 intervention. Thankfully, with all the flows and even the signaling of the market ahead, you've seen the activities of speculators go down drastically. The new market conduct rules are also ensuring that the kind of ease with which people contributed to uh, demand is also tapered down. But the most important thing is that the medium to long-term um, underlining solution, which is boosting our balance of uh, trade, boosting our balance of payment on a sustainable basis, and most importantly, in a diversified manner, because again, as she presented, if we're relying on commodities and the broad view is that commodity markets, though gold and oil are fine, but commodity markets could take a tank in the medium term. If it's not broad-based um, uh, uh, on a regular basis, then we could find ourselves back in that situation. And I think that already you find with, for example, the agri programs like the planting for food and jobs, the food import bill, at least for some specific items like corn, et cetera, are, you know, are beginning to come down. We need to make it broader to rise in particular, et cetera. With the um, 1D1F program, we need to invest a bit more resources into it and tackle like machinery-related items that are a significant import bill to us. And uh, as we succeed at those, what we are seeing can stabilize. But I'll let my prof um, uh, uh, tidy it up for me. Over to you, prof. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think the depreciation, of, uh, the, the CD depreciation is a cause of concern for businesses because most of our imports and even the duty they pay is tied to the, to the exchange rate or to the foreign currency. 
So any time there is a depreciation, they end up paying more. And the next time they're going to import, I mean, they need to uh, spend more CDs or get more CDs to, to get the needed uh, foreign currency. So that is a source of worry. And that affects food prices and prices of other commodities uh, on the market. Now, the courses, I think we have several of them. We have short-term uh, courses, uh, and then we also have some of the long-term uh, challenges. One area I, I think, I think they, they, quite a number of, of, of uh, the points have been raised earlier, but I think speculation is also something we need to guard against. And I have spoken to some of my friends in the media. Anytime we see some movements in the exchange rate, every second there's a discussion on the exchange rate. And there's that panic that we signal, uh, uh, we send out. I've met a couple of people who went to buy to hoard basically because of this noise we feed to the system. And I think that is not helping us. Then also we have others who um, buy foreign currency. We have no track of any transaction in most, even African countries, South Africa, Kenya, Senegal, you name them. Anytime you exchange foreign currency, you need to send an ID, they have to enter into the system. But that is not in our case. Now it's so easy, you make a phone call, somebody comes on a motorbike and gives you foreign currency. I have done it before, I must be honest with you. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's so easy to get dollars or pounds or whatever out of our country. So no matter how much Bank of Ghana pumps into the system, there is a leakage, there is a way out. People take it out easily. If we're able to monitor this and know where the demand pressure is coming, then we can fashion our policies to address them. Happily, yesterday, I stumbled into a circular directive from Bank of Ghana to all the forest bureaus and, and, and other financial institutions, directing them to keep records to you know, ensure that the proper thing is done. To what extent do we follow us to enforce? I am yet to hear from my, my minister whether that is being done. But I think, apart from the other factors we have heard, these are some of the gray areas we need to tighten and ensure that we're able to manage the exchange rate system. And I think earlier when I alluded to this 10-point industrialization strategy, as well as the planting for food and jobs, if you read them, a lot of brilliant ideas, but we have not achieved much with these two uh, policies. Planting for food and jobs, yes, we've seen food production increase and for some staples like rice, maize and the rest, uh, the, the, uh, how much we produce is going up and therefore we might not have to import so much. But we need to do more so that we rely more on locally produced items rather than uh, imported items. Then uh, uh, lastly, we, we handle too much cash in our system. There's too much cash in circulation. We have seen that most of our traders go to China, to the Middle East. How many of them route it through the banking system? Very few. The majority carry the cash, though it's illegal, they still manage to take them out. So there is a lot of pressure on our uh, exchange rate. I wonder why, for instance, we don't have a Chinese bank, for instance, who would ensure that those who go there can use the yuan Chinese currency to transact business. I'm told Nigeria has done it where you don't need a dollar to go and trade in China. Why can't we do the same? Rather, we allow our traders to go through all of this and put so much pressure on our exchange rate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I have a series of questions, and I think I'm just going to try and direct the ones that specifically mention you. Um, in addition to two, which I think uh, Mr. Ponkrumah can handle. Now, we've just exited that IMF program. Um, the question says, is the IMF really the solution to Ghana's problems? And I'd like to tie that into another question uh, that says, Germany issued a 10-year bond at a yield uh, to maturity of 0.27%. Um, now, there's a dash there. Okay, yeah. Uh, are we really saying that Ghana or African nations are so risky that we're borrowing upwards of uh, 8%? Um, 
No, the IMF is not the solution to our problems. I think yesterday the president mentioned that we've, we're just exiting, I think, about our 13th IMF program since um, independence. Yeah. For a nation that says that we're capable of managing our own affairs, that is not exactly a good testimony. But essentially what the IMF tells us to do anytime they have to bail us out are things that we must be doing ourselves. There are things that we must know and must be doing ourselves. And there are things that today we have legislated some into being because expecting that different administrations will do, you know, it has failed us about 13 different times. Mm -hmm. I think what now needs to happen is that as we exit and as we put in place uh, at least some of the mechanisms I spoke uh, about earlier, we need some consistency in delivery. And we need to explore also some creative ways by which predominantly we can finance some of our development needs without having to resort to the fiscal at every point in time. Because it is this unbridled desire to always resort to the fiscal when domestic resource is not up to the levels where it should be. That usually starts this exercise of overspending, deficits go up, debts are racked up, and all the issues that follow up. So broadly, we have clarity on what we need to do. Thankfully, we are out uh, of this program. And now we have legislated some of the things into being. We just need to be you know, consistent in delivering on it. And I, I go back to my earlier point that if what we've seen in the last two and a half years in terms of discipline is anything to go by, uh, we should be able to do a bit more of that uh, moving forward. Okay. The other question has to do with, uh, and this is for you, Prof. Uh, in your view, what has been the impact of the rebasing and the additional borrowings on our economic fundamentals centering on the CD? Sounds like an exam question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like a two-in-one. Um, That's right. Yes. Um, I think the rebasing is, is good because um, for those of you who remember, I couldn't imagine us if you want to carry 100,000 CDs if you convert to the old currency. Those days where we, we had to move them in sacks, uh, it wasn't convenient. A lot of the um, ATMs were breaking down because of pressure. And, and there were several other things. Yes, because of the uh, rounding up of some of the figures, it led to some level of inflation. But I think the rebasing uh, has been good for our economy, and I don't think we should. Uh, run away from that. Uh, now, the, 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 yeah, the on, other sir. question, um, rebasing, and there was the second one. Yeah, the, the, the additional borrowings on, on our economic fundamentals. Yes, um, I think I, I, I did highlight or mention um, earlier. The additional borrowings have helped to some extent uh, for some infrastructure projects that we've seen in this country. If we hadn't borrowed, I don't think we would have uh, had them. One clear example is the Terminal 3, uh, our airport, Terminal 3. It's, it's a beautiful edifice that it shows what borrowing can do, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> if you use the money judiciously. Um, we've seen our N N1 uh, motorway. We've seen several other uh, projects that, that dotted around the country through borrowing. However, excessive borrowing can have repercussions on debt servicing. If you look at how much we pay, how much interest we pay annually, when you take out wages and salaries, then interest payments, uh, statutory payments, national health and whatever, we are left with very little capital expenditure. So you employ people, but you have, they have very little to work with. That is why we ought to be cautious in borrowing. Uh, we borrow to invest, but not to consume. Okay, thank you. Um, back to you, uh, Mr. Ponkrumah, and um, I mean, these are questions from our audience. Um, this is in the face of declining mon monetary policy rate and foreign capital flight. How do you plan to harness the private sector to fill the gap? Um, and then there's a second one. Are you ready for the second one? So the second question has to do with uh, what can be done to improve the services at GIPC, Ghana Investment Promotion Centre, uh, who simply do not approve uh, TSAs. I'm believing this is trade service agreements uh, as this um, discourages new investment. I hope I got the TSAs right. If I didn't, um, Mr. or Ms. Anonymous, just uh, correct me quickly via Slido. So very quickly, on the matter of... Okay. 
Well, that's buying me some time. It's trans, trans, uh, transitional uh, service agreements. Very well. That's so on the matter of borrowing, so I think one of the um, elements that we have to force into the borrowing conversation, and I want to encourage my colleagues in the media so to do, is to also pay attention, not just to the nominal figures, but to the rate of debt accumulation, the annual rate of debt accumulation. You would notice, for example, that from 2017 coming down, indeed, if you compare the numbers from about 2014 going, and you look at the significant hikes in the rate of debt accumulation, mm -hmm. that took us beyond a certain threshold. And if you look at the rate of debt accumulation, at least since 2017, you notice that gradually we are slowing down the rate of debt accumulation. It's like a vehicle descending a hill at top speed because you have built a certain appetite in the country, and there are many services and even uh, jobs that are paid through the fiscal. And if you've done a rate of debt accumulation that ensures that all of these people are on, you cannot necessarily in one year just cut it. Your vehicle will roll over. But you can slow it down gradually, and you notice that even though in nominal terms we may get a euro bond of three billion, et cetera, if you look at the rate of debt accumulation, it's gradually coming down. The second thing I think we need to introduce into that conversation is a debt sustainability analysis. And very often you find people talking about the nominal figures, but don't look at the debt sustainability analysis. Like Prof mentioned, we should borrow to invest and not borrow for consumption. And if you borrow to invest, you see the output show up in your GDP growth for the year. And the debt sustainability analysis would show clearly, when you do the analysis, it will show clearly that, yes, your nominal has gone up, but, for example, your GDP has gone up way higher than that. Consequently, your debt-to-GDP ratio, as is now, is beginning to see a downward trend. So if you look at it in nominal terms only, you may run home with the argument that, ah, the nominal figure has gone up. But I think that for those of you who uh, engineer the public conversation, you should introduce these elements and help us get a, um, um, a balanced view of it. How do we help private sector to get uh, more access to funding with all of the issues that you have spoken about. I think one of the things that central government needs to do is also to help um, the business community or the private sector attract funding to itself. Not all funding necessarily needs to come through the fiscal because it has all sorts of implications. But at least if we tidy up and the ratings agencies are giving us some good ratings, etc., we tidy up the financial services market uh, so that we have institutions here that can leverage on these developments and attract financing for private sector to pick, whether it's corresponding banking arrangements or whatever, for private sector to pick at some of these um, lower benchmark rates. I think that it will help ensure that we are moving, but not all of it is on the backbone of government with the necessary encumbrances that come with it. And then the last uh, point, these TSCs that we talk about is not um, uh, just the mere fact that because somebody wants to sign a TSA with government, the GIPC should just go ahead and sign it. There are some TSAs that are inimical to our national interest, and it is important that um, the GIPC, I know, for example, in one ins you know, instance where over a year you have a major superpower that has a standard agreement that they want to sign with various countries, but the GIPC says this clause in this agreement will go contrary to um, our local provisions or our interests as a country. And some of those nuances, I think we should rather support our entities that are negotiating for us to get the necessary exemptions in those spaces. And it's not just a blanket thing that because somebody wants to sign a TSA with us, we just sign it when it is inimical to uh, our interest. At least for what they've been doing, you see the FDI numbers um, beginning to pick up, which is a good thing. So it shows that they are doing some good negotiation uh, for us, and I think we should encourage them. Okay. I'm going back to Slido. I'm going to rephrase this question so it allows everyone to um, take a shot at it. And it, it actually says, what risk management measures um, are we putting in place? But uh, that would limit it to uh, government. But I'd rather want to know from your uh, perch, what should we be putting in place in terms of uh, uh, risk management in relation to the percentage of offshore holdings and uh, in our investment portfolio. Um, and I think you had a couple of graphs that spoke to that, uh, Neville. Have we lost you? I think it's important to realize that, you know, offshore uh, investments are they are not inherently bad. I mean, of course, you're talking about in the context of uh, a weakening currency. But 
I think what should be done is to realize that you know, the, the hot money or helicopter money or offshore investments are there to provide price discovery. Because they're in and out, you know, they tend to be uh, very fleeting in their nature, they allow for proper price discovery. And it also gives a feedback mechanism in terms of whether the policies that are being instituted domestically are viewed favorably or not offshore. What then needs to be done is to complement, uh, you know, with the domestic savings pool, whether it's pension funds, et cetera, to supplement that. So in instances where uh, offshore investors are selling, uh, by nature of a pension fund book, it tends to be very long term and liability driven, you know, they can absorb some of that pressure. So I think it's a complementary effort. You can't uh, sustainably run a, a domestic fixed income market by having 100% domestic investors, because you're never going to get that price discovery that you need. Neither can you run it by having 100% offshore, because it's going to be extremely volatile. So you need a balance between the two. As to whether, as to what measures are being instituted, I think I'll leave that for, for the minister to, to articulate some of those measures. But purely from, from, a, from, a, from an outside, outsider's perspective looking in, I think you need a balance between the two. And it's not, uh, as I showed in my, in my previous slides, um, having you know, 30 40% offshore is not something that is unique to Ghana. But the question then becomes, what are we putting next to that in order to, to supplement uh, you know, the, the, the volatility that may come with, uh, with a relatively high offshore investment? OK. Uh, does anyone want to add something to that? I think ultimately we have to make Ghanaians richer. Because it's when more Ghanaians are richer, have more disposable income, that you can get a lot more Ghanaians taking up the CD-denominated uh, bonds and, uh, may I say, crowding out the um, offshore uh, investors. And the way to do that is to ensure that Ghanaians hold the commanding heights of our economy, take advantage of the investment and growth opportunities, retain the profits, and then they can be the ones um, to buy in. Okay. Um, I think we'll take another round of maybe two or three questions. Uh, there seems to be a short-term chase for revenue on imports. Uh, that is hurting importers doing costings after an import is it's on an average of 115 percent duties and uh, taxes. Uh, Mr. Pongroma, uh, I'm coming to you for this one, uh, <laughs> and then I'll get Prof's thoughts on this. Um, how much of this could be hurting the economy when the the imports uh, and, and the taxes, the revenue that's on there. Of course, you have to manage your revenue in order to uh, bridge the gap between that and the expenditure. Uh, but at what point does it become uh, an albatross around the neck of an import? Or at what point should it be optimal for us to achieve what we're looking for? Um, I think we all can admit that too much of our revenues come through um, the, the ports. And we don't have enough of it coming from direct taxes and other retail revenue options in this country. And as a first step, we need to focus on that. Number two, even for the ports, ports thrive on volumes. So when you have what appears to become a punitive um, import regime, where the taxes and et cetera are all so high, uh, it becomes counterproductive. And that is why I think earlier I mentioned that trade facilitation is one of the very quick things that um, uh, we need to be tackling. The uh, economic management team and cabinet have done some work on it. I think on the 3rd of, and maybe let me do some ambush marketing, on the 3rd of April, uh, the vice president will be leading an economic management team town hall meeting, and he will have occasion to speak to some of the uh, reforms that are immediately being introduced to make trade facilitation easier for our people. Okay. Prof, did you want to add something? Yes, I think uh, the minister has uh, said it all. We rely too much on import duties, um, as well as the port, for most of our revenue. Why? Because we pay little direct taxes. Very few people pay direct taxes, so we keep taxing the same old people, and that is quite difficult. I was quite surprised to hear the number of people in Ashanti region, or Kumasi, to be precise, who pay income tax. It's, it was quite shocking to hear that. And, and it's very clear, many people are within the informal sector. Uh, they don't pay taxes. Our artisans, uh, on average, earn about 1,200, 1,500 a month. But they are not within the tax net. Whereas if you start earning from 300, 400, you start paying taxes uh, if you are within the formal sector. So 
the way forward is to try and broaden the tax base by roping in most of these people in the informal sector. And I see the uh, use of the tin and other means of knowing where people are, the kind of economic activity they are engaged in, and by so doing, you can uh, rope them into the tax net. But that has to come with some benefit. They have to know or assess some benefits as well. It shouldn't be just taxing for tax sake when they go to the hospital, there are, there are no beds. When they go to, for facilities, they cannot assess public service. I think the two have to go hand in hand. Then a quick point on the, uh, the, the uh, last discussion about the, the risk element. I would say for a long-term measure, we need to grow our revenue base. Because as for borrowing, getting investors, uh, offshore investment, yes, that can come in. But that shouldn't be our long-term solution. The long-term solution is for us to grow our revenue base and, and, and we'll, we'll need very little uh, euro bond and the rest to run our, our economy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. So uh, one final question that uh, goes to every one of you. Um, in the presentation, there was a clear um, upside in how the island states like Seychelles have harnessed a certain am amount of infrastructure and targeting tourism to uh, improve their position in the ranking. We have more than 460 kilometers of coastline, a very beautiful midland with a lot of green and a breathtaking savanna. What should we be doing? if we want to wrap, you know, grow on, 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 why have we not picked that as a low-hanging fruit? Or can we do so? Um, what would it take? And in addition to this, you add your final words. I'm going to start off with you, uh, Neville. Mr. Ponkoma, do you have the microphone? Okay. So we are down to... Yeah, I certainly echo those in, uh, sentiments in, insofar as, uh, you know, boosting the, the tourism base. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, economies that you've just mentioned, a, a large proportion of what comes in um, as its FX, as it feeds into, uh, you know, central bank uh, FX numbers and, and subsequently supporting the currency, uh, that is an important um, source of, of, of revenue, and there's certainly a lot more that uh, can be done uh, on, uh, in, in Ghana to, to actually try and improve that. So I'll, I'll certainly say to whatever degree that we can, we must. Um, as to the policies, I think I'll leave that to, to the minister to outline what exactly uh, him and his team are doing. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Pankuma. Um I think we need stronger collaboration between state actors and the industry. You find industry players who, for example, want to sink 5, 10, 15 million into um, a particular um, tourism enclave, even if it's to develop it or to build a new one. But often the ancillary services that will now ensure that clients and markets get there, whether it's roads or helipads or the basic infrastructure as we spoke about, um, appears uh, a bit delayed. And in terms of our general infrastructure development in this country, it follows a path that is not necessarily tied to the tourism sector. And so I think that a closer collaboration between what we are generally doing for infrastructure and the industry so that we prioritize some of these uh, areas will help um, deepen activity in that space and um, activity in general. And while at that, I think that we also need significantly to, to, to promote domestic tourism. I mean, for all of these things that you talk about, we have at least about 20-something million Ghanaians who should be our first point of contact in patronizing and visiting uh, these sites. And then on their back, you can expect foreign um, uh, tourists uh, to come in. And I'm hopeful that, uh, again, as we promote a bit of that and deepen collaboration, we can do more. But in, in, in my closing remarks, I would say that the road to economic recovery is often a long and difficult one. And if anything at all, in recent years, as a country, collectively, we have demonstrated that we are back on that path and are beginning to walk that journey. What we need is consistency and discipline uh, so that we can get to that destination in the shortest possible time. Thank you very much. Professor Korte. Yes, um, I think we need to market our tourist destinations. I don't think we've done uh, to Ghanaians and also to the international community. I often feel embarrassed when on a flight to Ghana, uh, you sit with a tourist and he or she starts asking you about certain tourist destinations in your country and you have no idea. 
it gets quite embarrassing. It was, I, I think as Ghanaians, we should know the various tourist sites and, and uh, try to assess uh, them. Then, public-private partnership. I don't think government alone can provide the needed infrastructure in all of these tourist sites. It's impossible. Um, government should partner with the private sector to provide infrastructure and even to run some of these tourist sites. Uh, um, otherwise, if government wants to do it all, I, I, I bet you we'll still be where, where we are because already we are, we are challenged in terms of our revenue GDP figures. And if you want to delve more into other areas, it becomes more difficult. So public-private partnership would help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Celeste. I think enough was said now about the tourist industry. I just don't think it was ever a big priority because you've got gold, you've got cocoa, you've got oil. So a lot of attention was given to those. But I think just to add to Professor's um, focus on PPPs, uh, what we've noticed, and we live in this continent, every country in Africa is rather reactive than proactive in diversifying, it, diversifying its economy. And what I mean by that is we, we as, an, as a continent are not looking forward as what does the world need from us in the future. And that's why I focused earlier a little bit on agriculture, I think, is the next, next best thing for Africa. So we just need to really get our infrastructure correct to, to focus on agro-processing. The reason why I'm looking at this is because I've started reading studies of how um, global warming, how all these aspects are going to start affecting agricultural sectors in other countries. And Africa is one of the continents that still has the most arable land. We need to focus on those future prospects. Tourism, the same. It's, uh, we have seen that uh, Asians and more from, uh, uh, from your Eastern Bloc European nations are now visiting African nations. And we need to take advantage of this new diverse specter of, of investment or tourism coming into these economies. So we need to do the studies. The only way we can do these studies is by having skills transfers from the private sector um, and then seeing what, what Africa can do for the world over the next decade. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's say a big thank you to Celeste Falconer, Neville Mann, Dimika, uh, Professor Peter Korte, and Mr. Kojo Obon Nkrumah. Uh, you may please resume your seats and, uh, as we wrap up. Now, uh, the presentation as well as the uh, Invest in Africa report are available on the First National uh, bank website, um, but if you don't want to stick within the digital bounds and would like a hard copy, speak to your relationship manager. And if you don't have a relationship with anyone at uh, First National Bank, today is a good time to kick off with uh, a new relationship. Uh, we're coming to the end of this morning's um, Economic and Business Breakfast Forum. And uh, with that, help me welcome the head of Commercial, Corporate and Investment Banking at FNB, Mr. Victor Yawasanti. Thank you very much. Well, um, Kenyan balance, all too soon we have come to an end. <laughs> um, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Uh, we started this journey about a month ago when uh, I think Delali and I started engaging the media. It wasn't um, a particularly good time because everybody was concerned about the city. Uh, we tried to put some articles out there and it caused quite a bit of a stir uh, where we had to keep explaining. Um, so when I say thank you to Celeste and I say thank you to Neville, I say thank you also because of the work we did previously um, leading to today because each time we put our thoughts together, we had to come to you to make sure we're saying the right things. And uh, um, there is a reason why RMB is rated as one of the best uh, research uh, houses in Africa. And um, I hope that uh, you connect, connect with us even beyond today, so that uh, you can get some of the insights that we get. The number they give us is 5.2. I know a lot of people always end up asking you, so where would the dollar end when the year ends? The number is 5.2. Let's work with it. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for coming all the way from South Africa, uh, my colleagues, uh, Celeste and Neville, thank you. Of course, uh, Mr. Minister, I asked you to stay slightly um, uh, longer. Um, today, I found the economist in you. Um, I know uh, you're focused on law these days, but you have to go back to some of your fundamentals to try and speak to us. Uh, this wasn't a conclave meeting. We used to have it. I know you're busy lately. Uh, we'll do it a bit, a bit more. Uh, thanks for coming. I know you want to go because today is when we pass the right information um, uh, bill, 
and uh, you must be in parliament. And uh, we appreciate very much that you didn't cancel. For a moment, we're worried that uh, you'll be pulled in because this is your bill. We appreciate you, and uh, please let's see you a bit more. Um, thank you for coming. Um, Prof. <laughs> Where's Prof? Uh, I hope there's no bike waiting for him for some dollars. Has he gone? <laughs> <laughs> so, Prof, uh, please, next time when you need the dollars, please call us. Um, we are here to help you. We are First National Bank. Uh, we have quite a bit of it, and we'll give you a good rate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and please take the message, everybody. Uh, make sure when you need your dollars, um, just call us. Um, we are here to help you as our strap license. Um, thank you very much, our uh, clients. Um, uh, we behaved well. Ghanaian time was slightly better today. We came at 8.30, and uh, at least most of us did. We are happy we did. Next year, we'll be bigger and better. Uh, we'll continue to give you the information you need so that you continue to be on your exit because we are as good as you are as our business partners and we are always happy to host you. Thank you so much. This year has been the year of the city, even though we thought it was going to be the year of the infrastructure. But uh, the city first, and then we can talk about infrastructure. Thanks for coming and see you soon. Thank you. And from me, I'd like to say thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been uh, a worthwhile learning experience. Again, if you need to download the presentations, I go to First National Bank.